There is a silent killer loose in the national forests of the West. The victims are found mostly in stands of lodgepole pine. They can easily be identified by their red and gray color. They appear singularly, in groups and over entire forest stands. All of this devastation is at the hands of a small black insect, the mountain pine beetle. The killing fields for the mountain pine beetle are enormous. The pest spreads as a red glow throughout much of British Columbia and across the western states. The beetle will infest all species of pine, but lodgepole pine is its preferred host. Each year, the toll is millions of trees with a cost in the millions of dollars. Gene Ammon heads a research unit of the Intermountain Research Station based in Ogden, Utah. The unit is charged with finding ways to stalk this killer. The first step is to get a grasp of the problem, a problem that cuts across almost all forest resources. The mountain pine beetle problem is really uh, one uh, of uh, a number of facets. Uh, it's not only timber management and losses of timber, but it's also loss of wildlife cover, scenery, and uh, in addition, the uh, hydrologic values that may be in, involved with heavy uh, timber loss. The problem is widespread. The mountain pine beetle is the most important uh, forest insect in the western United States, causing more loss of timber than any other insect, particularly in lodgepole pine. Uh, it is closely associated with lodgepole pine and it seems like uh, it goes through a cycle of uh, the beetle killing the lodgepole pine and then we have a wildfire that regenerates the stand and in another 60 or so years we have a stand of lodgepole that is ready for, for mountain pine beetle again. And so it seems to be a very uh, uh, closely uh, uh, coordinated relationship there between mountain pine beetle and lodgepole and fire. This self-perpetuating cycle of lodgepole pine, mountain pine beetle, and fire is at the core of the problem. Each depends on the other for survival. The lodgepole depends on the beetle to create high-risk conditions for fire that will burn off the overmature forest and allow for reseeding. The beetle depends on lodgepole for survival. The beetle and the pine have evolved in a mutually dependent cycle of growth, infestation, fire, and regrowth. Few beetles are found in a young lodgepole stand, but when the trees mature, the beetles attack, killing up to 90% of the largest trees. This creates a buildup of deadfall. When the heavy accumulation of deadfall burns, the hot fire kills trees such as spruce and fir, which compete with lodgepole. The fire clears the ground, allowing lodgepole to reseed. When the pine matures, it's again ripe for another infestation. Beetles start attacking lodgepole when it reaches maturity between 60 and 80 years. At that time, the tree's diameter is usually 8 inches or larger. At this size, the tree's inner bark, or phloem, is usually thick enough to support the pest. The phloem is the food for beetle larvae. An important aspect in understanding the cycle of beetle, lodgepole, and fire is the biology of the beetle. Now this tree was infested sometime during the last two weeks. We're into the second week here in August, and uh, the female will fly to this tree, start the attack, and then she will release the aggregative pheromone. At that time, other beetles are attracted to the tree and uh, the mass attack takes place. And when this uh, uh, tree is essentially filled up with beetles and the uh, verbenone, which is the anti-aggregative pheromone, becomes too strong, then the population switches its attack to the surrounding trees. 
we can tell uh, about how long the beetle has been in the tree by uh, the length of the egg galleries which it's constructing. This one is only about two inches long so uh, that beetle has probably been in the tree about um, two or three days. The beetles uh, construct their gallery then and they will continue to uh, lay eggs in those galleries at the rate of about five per inch until cold weather sets in and at that time uh, the uh, beetles will uh, become too cold to continue their uh, gallery construction. Many of the eggs will have hatched by that time and the larvae uh, begin to bore out at right angles to the main egg gallery and um, at this time on this tree we don't see any egg or larval galleries but they will bore at right angles and uh, feeding in this this inner bark and that action of the um, beetle coupled with the blue stain fungi that it carries and the microorganisms will uh, kill a tree. The blue stain fungi invade the sapwood and uh, the, of course the larvae boring around the tree through the phloem will girdle the tree and that uh, will kill, kill a tree. Fire plays an important role in the cycle. Under natural conditions, beetle infestations are normally limited by small spot fires that create a mosaic of lodgepole ages and sizes. But over the last 50 years, under an aggressive federal fire control policy, fires were not allowed to burn. As a result, trees have survived longer and matured over vast acreages at about the same rate. The result is a widespread susceptibility to mountain pine beetle. The management of mountain pine beetle is aimed at disrupting the pine beetle fire cycle. The attack on the beetle is three-pronged. It is led by research, forest pest management, and forest and district managers. The uh, Intermountain Research Station uh, is responsible for developing uh, the knowledge uh, related to mountain pine beetle or about mountain pine beetle. And then when we have this basic uh, biology and, and uh, ecological uh, information and can proceed to develop some management strategies, then it's through the forest pest management groups in the regional offices that much of our technology transfer occurs. Our role in pest management is essentially one of detection, evaluation of infestations and making recommendations to the line manager to deal with those infestations. As a part of that, one of our major responsibilities is to serve as a bridge between the research in the Forest Service and the line manager who is able to take these tools and utilize them to their advantage. During the past 20 years, research scientists have learned much about the beetle pest management specialists, and national forest managers have tested this knowledge in the field. They've tested methods to predict which stands are in hazard and ways to reduce losses. By knowing which stands are threatened, forest managers can set priorities and build beetle control into their long-range forest plans. If trees are threatened, managers have several options. One may be to do nothing. In areas that are not going to be used for timber production, such as national parks and wilderness areas, the mountain pine beetle is not a problem. But the beetle is a very serious problem for land managers who are concerned about timber production. Another option is to harvest the trees before the beetles do. Silviculturists can monitor the beetle hazard and harvest the trees when an outbreak looks likely. Managers can create a mosaic of age and size classes by using small clear cuts and partial cutting some of the surrounding stand. The idea is to disrupt the food source for the beetle and regenerate a stand of different ages and species of trees. Barry Bolenbacher is a silviculturist on the Flathead National Forest in Montana, one of the hardest hit by the pine beetle. 
He is on the front lines in applying strategies for slowing the beetle's spread. The uh, management option of uh, age class diversity and species diversity is pretty well uh, integrated in this, in this location here. We have in the uh, far background a uh, regenerated stand of mixed species of Douglas fir, larch, and lodgepole that was logged about 25 to 30 years ago. Here, where we're standing here today in the foreground, we have a mixed species stand of spruce, Douglas fir, larch, alpine fir, and lodgepole that's approximately 10 years of age. This restructuring of age classes in a local area where in the past they've all been mature, 100-year-old or older stands, in the future will tend to limit uh, the susceptibility of the broader area from a mountain pine beetle standpoint. The species mix is of particular uh, importance, not only from an age class distribution, but when mountain pine beetle does impact a stand, say this stand grew up uh, 80 years from now, with the mix of species we have in it today and at that time, impacts will be a lot less than if this had been a pure stand of lodgepole pine, which it probably was pretty close to a pure stand uh, prior to uh, the regeneration harvest that took place. Where there are special concerns, thinning may be the best solution. It increases the space between trees, lessening the chance that beetles will reach nearby trees. The management option of thinning in lodgepole pine stands, as exemplified in this stand, gives the manager the option of delaying regeneration harvest while meeting some of the cover objectives for wildlife or watershed objectives or visual objectives in a local area. What is entailed in this type of a treatment is thinning approximately 50% of the trees in the stand, logging them to a landing and taking them to the mill. This type of treatment tends to increase vigor in the leaf trees and creates a microclimate a little warmer, a little sunnier within the stand, less conducive to beetle mortality. Where the beetle threatens highly valued trees, pesticides may be the answer, although a limited one, as Ken Gibson explains. Uh, hardly ever these days do we recommend the use of chemicals in the control of bark beetle populations. There is one area, however, in which we feel very comfortable in recommending a chemical spray. It's one that is registered and one which has found wide utility throughout the Intermountain West, particularly in lodgepole pine stands, but in, to a certain extent in ponderosa pine as well. And it has to do with those areas in which aesthetic values are higher than timber values, campgrounds, recreation areas, summer home areas, administrative sites, that sort of thing, where individual trees are desirable to keep on the site and that is the use of preventive sprays. The one that is uh, recommended right now and registered for use by the Environmental Protection Agency is Carboril. Uh, right now we have a formulation which is uh, commercially available. The formulation changed from time to time, but the one that we use right now is called 7SL, and it is available, a water-based chemical which is mixed in a 1% solution, a spray to the trees to a height uh, beyond which the beetles essentially won't attack the tree, and we get excellent two-year protection uh, through that means. Again, we don't often recommend chemicals, but this is one exception to that where, again, where aesthetic values are high, uh, this chemical is one that is recommended and works quite well. Natural predators of the beetle provide some help in controlling the pest, but can't stop an epidemic outbreak. The mountain pine beetle has a number of uh, insect parasites and predators, and, uh, but probably the most important predator is the woodpecker. And uh, in some of the studies that uh, the Intermountain Station has done, we found that the woodpeckers account for uh, more uh, larvae and uh, mountain pine beetles than all the other parasites and predators uh, combined. Now, the, uh, we've studied uh, the parasites and predators uh, through uh, population sampling for about 20 years and we find that they simply cannot control a mountain pine beetle population. They uh, do not build up quickly enough and by the time we start getting some build up most of the trees in a stand have already been killed. We think that the 
Not, uh, woodpecker may be very important in uh, helping to keep uh, mountain pine beetle populations at a low level, but uh, once they start to build, then the parasites and predators are unable to keep pace with them. Gene Ammon and his research team are looking at a new approach, one that uses the beetle's own chemical communication system. The system works both to attract and repel the beetle. Currently, uh, the Intermountain Research Station, in uh, cooperation with the forest pest management groups in the regional offices, are testing the mountain pine beetle pheromone, verbenone. It's a uh, chemical which the beetle releases, uh, a chemical messenger, and uh, the beetles apparently use that uh, as a spacing, a way of spacing themselves and uh, avoiding competition within a tree. When that's present in very strong concentration, then the beetles uh, no longer attack uh, a tree that's under attack and proceed to attack surrounding trees. And the, what we're using is a synthetic pheromone put in a bubble capsule and then placed in stands to see if the beetles can be kept out. And the preliminary results look very promising. The verbenone in bubble caps will not be a useful way to uh, prevent damage in a, in a forest stand. Uh, it would be too expensive for that. However, there is some uh, research being done with an encapsulated form uh, which might be used to protect high-value stands such as plantations, that type of thing. Uh, as we see it now, it's going to be more a way of protecting the valuable trees and campgrounds around administrative sites and uh, around summer homes. This is the mountain pine beetle uh, tree bait. It's uh, used to uh, attract beetles to the tree that you, uh, or stand that you want to uh, bring the beetles into to have, it, uh, have them attack the uh, stand and then uh, log the trees out. It consists of the female pheromone, the male pheromone, and two vials of the host terpene which is uh, myrcene. We're standing in the middle of a, a unit as a part of an ongoing timber sale which will be clear cut. This particular tree had an aggregative bait attached to it to help concentrate the beetles in this particular area. The beetles, we know the beetles have existed in this area for some time. Anticipating the populations will continue to build in this area. We can use the aggregative baits as a tool to help the land manager concentrate beetles into stands which will then be removed. In this case, this unit will be clear cut sometime later this year or next spring before the beetles fly. The beetles will then be, that are in the logs, will then be taken to a mill site. The logs will be processed and the population will be essentially eliminated uh, through that method. The baits have become a very valuable tool to the land manager in an effort to concentrate beetles in an area scheduled for logging in which we can use that tool, that method essentially, to eliminate the beetles from infested areas, keeping them from moving into un adjacent uninfested areas. When conditions are right, mountain pine beetle attacks can be rapid and devastating. The best defense is to understand the hazard and have a plan of action that effectively disrupts the beetle's food source. Stalking this forest killer requires knowledge gained through research. Knowledge which in turn is disseminated by regional pest specialists and applied by forest managers. <laughs>